Chapter Fourteen of the Egoist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Egoist by George Meredith. Chapter Fourteen. Sir Willoughby and Laetitia. I prepare Miss Dale. Sir Willoughby thought of his promise to Clara. He trifled a while with young Crossjay, and then sent the boy flying, and wrapped himself in meditation. So shall you see standing many a statue of statesmen who have died in harness for their country. In the hundred and fourth chapter of the thirteenth volume of the Book of Egoism, it is written, Possession without obligation to the object possessed approaches felicity. It is the rarest condition of ownership. For example, the possession of land is not without obligation both to the soil and the tax collector. The possession of fine clothing is oppressed by obligation. Gold, jewellery, works of art, enviable household furniture are positive fetters. The possession of a wife we find surcharged with obligation. In all these cases, possession is a gentle term for enslavement bestowing the sort of felicity attained to by the helot drink. You can have the joy, the pride, the intoxication of possession. You can have no free soul. But there is one instance of possession, and that the most perfect, which leaves us free, under not a shadow of obligation, receiving ever, never giving, or if giving, giving only our waste. As it were, so of what respect, by form of perspiration, radiation if you like unconscious poral bountifulness and it is a beneficent process for the system our possession of an adoring female's worship is this instance the soft cherishable parsi is hardly at any season other than prostrate she craves nothing save that you continue in being her son which is your firm constitutional endeavour and thus you have a most exact alliance she supplying spirit to your matter, while at the same time presenting matter to your spirit, verily a comfortable opposition. The gods do bless it. That they do so, indeed, is evident in the men they select for such a felicitous crown and aureole. Weak men would be rendered nervous by the flattery of a woman's worship, or they would be for returning it, at least partially, as though it could be bandied to and fro without emulgence of the poetry or they would be pitiful and quite spoil the thing. Some would be for transforming the beautiful solitary vestal flame by the first effort of the multiplication table into your hearth-fire of slippered affection. So these men are not they whom the gods have ever selected, but rather men of a pattern with themselves, very high and very solid men, who maintain the crown by holding divinely independent of the great emotion they have sown. Even for them a pass of danger is ahead, as we shall see in our sample of one among the highest of them. A clear approach to felicity had long been the portion of Sir Willoughby Pattern in his relations with Letitia Dale. She belonged to him. He was quite unshackled by her. She was everything that is good in a parasite, nothing that is bad. His dedicated critic she was, reviewing him with a favour equal to perfect efficiency in her office. And whatever the world might say of him, to her the happy gentleman could constantly turn for his refreshing balsamic bath. She flew to the soul in him, pleasing the arousing sensations of that inhabitant. And he allowed her the right to fly, in the manner of kings, as we have heard, consenting to the privileges acted on by the cats. These may not address their majesties, but they may stare. Nor will it be contested that the attentive circular eyes of the humble domestic creatures are an embellishment to royal pomp and grandeur, such truly as should one day gain for them an inweaving and figurement in the place of bees, ermine tufts, and their various present decorations upon the august great robes, back flowing and foaming over the gaspy page boys. Further to quote from the same volume of the book, there is pain in the surrendering of that we are fain to relinquish. 
the idea is too exquisitely attenuate as are those of the whole bodyguard of the heart of egoism and will slip through unless you shall have made a study of the grows of volumes of the first and second sections of the book and that will take you up to senility or you must make a personal entry into the pages perchance or an escape out of them there was once a venerable gentleman for whom a white hair grew on the top of his nose laughing at removals he resigned himself to it in the end and lastingly contemplated the apparition it does not concern us what effect was produced on his countenance and his mind enough that he saw a fine thing but not so fine as the idea cited above which has been between the two eyes of humanity ever since women were sought in marriage with yonder old gentleman it may have been a ghostly hair or a disease of the optic nerves but for us it is a real growth and humanity might profitably imitate him in his patient speculation upon it sir willoughby patterne though ready in the pursuit of duty and policy an oft united couple to cast miss dale away had to consider that he was not simply so to speak casting her over a hedge he was casting her for a man to catch her and this was a much greater trial than it had been on the previous occasion when she went over bump to the ground in the arms of a husband there was no knowing how soon she might forget her soul's fidelity it had not hurt him to sketch the project of the conjunction benevolence assisted him but he winced and smarted at seeing it take shape it sullied his idea of Letitia. still if in spite of so great a change in her fortune her spirit could be guaranteed changeless he for the sake of pacifying his bride and to keep two serviceable persons near him at command might resolve to join them the vision of his resolution brought with it a certain pallid contempt of the physically faithless woman no wonder he betook himself to the book and opened it on the scorching chapters treating of the sex and the execrable wiles of that foremost creature of the chase who runs for life she is not spared in the biggest of books but close it the writing in it having been done chiefly by men men naturally receive their fortification from its wisdom and half a dozen of the popular sentences for the confusion of women cut in brass worn to a polish like sombre gold refreshed sir willoughby for his undertaking the examination of letitia's faded complexion braced him very cordially his clara jealous of this poor leaf he could have desired the transfusion of a quality or two from letitia to his bride but you cannot as in cookery obtain a mixture of the essences of these creatures and if as it is possible to do and as he has been doing recently with the pair of them at the hall you stew them in one pot they are far likelier to intensify the little birthmarks of individuality had they a tendency to excellence it might be otherwise they might then make the exchanges we wish for or scientifically concocted in a harem for a sufficient length of time by a sultan anything but obtuse they might it is however fruitless to dwell on what was only a glimpse of a wild regret like the crossing of two express trains along the rails of sir willoughby's head the ladies eleanor and isabel were sitting with miss dale all three at work on embroideries he had merely to look at miss eleanor she rose she looked at miss isabel and rattled her chatelaine to account for her departure after a decent interval miss isabel glided out such was the perfect discipline of the household sir willoughby played an air on the knee of his crossed leg letitia grew conscious of a meaning in the silence she said you have not been vexed by affairs to-day affairs he replied must be peculiarly vexations to trouble me concerning the country or my personal affairs i fancy i was alluding to the country i trust i am as good a patriot as any man living said he but i am used to the follies of my countrymen and we are on board a stout ship at the worst it's no worse than a rise in rates and taxes soup at the hall gates perhaps licensed to fell timber in one of the outer copses 
or some dozen loads of coal. You hit my feudalism. The knight in armor is gone, said Letitia, and the castle with the drawbridge. Immunity for our island has gone too since we took to commerce. We bartered independence for commerce. You hit our old controversy. A. Eh, but we do not want this overgrown population. However, we will put politics and sociology and the pack of their modern barbarous words aside. You read me intuitively. I have been, I will not say annoyed, but ruffled. I have much to do, and going into Parliament would make me almost helpless if I lose Vernon. You know of some absurd notion he has? Literary fame, and bachelor's chambers, and a chop-house, and the rest of it. She knew and thinking differently in the matter of literary fame, she flushed, and, ashamed of the flush, frowned. He bent over to her with the perusing earnestness of a gentleman about to trifle. You cannot intend that frown? Did I frown? You do. Now? Fiercely. Oh! Will you smile to reassure me? willingly, as well as I can. A gloom overcame him. With no woman on earth did he shine so as to recall to himself, Seigneur, and dame of the old French court, as he did with Letitia Dale. He did not wish the period revived, but reserved it as a garden to stray into when he was in the mood of displaying elegance and brightness in the society of a lady. And in speech Letitia helped him to the nice delusion. She was not devoid of grace of bearing, either. Would she preserve her beautiful responsiveness to his ascendancy? Hitherto she had, and for years, and quite fresh. But how of her as a married woman? Our souls are hideously subject to the conditions of our animal nature. A wife, possibly mother, it was within sober calculation that there would be great changes in her and the hint of any change appeared a total change to one of the lofty order, when they are called on to relinquish possession, instead of aspiring to it, say, all or nothing. Well, but if there was danger of the marriage tie effecting the slightest alteration of her character or habit of mind, wherefore press it upon a tolerably hardened spinster? Besides, though he did once put her hand in Vernon's for the dance, he remembered acutely that the injury then done by his generosity to his tender sensitiveness had sickened and tarnished the effulgence of two or three successive anniversaries of his coming of age. Nor had he altogether yet got over the passion of greed for the whole group of the well-favoured of the fair sex, which in his early youth had made it bitter for him to submit to the fickleness, not to say the modest fickleness of any handsome one of them in yielding her hands to a man and suffering herself to be led away ladies whom he had only heard of as ladies of some beauty incurred his wrath for having lovers or taking husbands he was of a vast embrace and do not exclaim in covetousness for well he knew that even under moslem law he could not have them all but as the enamoured custodian of the sex's purity that blushes at such big spots as lovers and husbands, and it was unbearable to see it sacrificed for others. Without their purity, what are they? What are fruiterer's plums? Unsaleable. Oh, for the bloom on them! As I said, I lose my right hand in Vernon, he resumed, and I am, it seems, inevitably to lose him, unless we contrive to fasten him down here. I think, my dear Miss Dale, you have my character. At least I should recommend my future biographer to you. With a caution, of course. You would have to write selfishness with a dash under it. I cannot endure to lose a member of my household, not under any circumstances. And a change of feeling toward me on the part of any, or my friends because of marriage, I think hard. I would ask you, how can it be for Vernon's good to quit an easy pleasant home for the wretched profession of literature? Wretchedly paying, I mean. He bowed to the authoress. Let him leave the house, if he imagines he will not harmonize with its young mistress. He is queer, 
though a good fellow but he ought in that event to have an establishment and my scheme for vernon men miss dale do not change to their old friends when they marry my scheme which would cause the alteration in his system of life to be barely perceptible is to build him a poetical little cottage large enough for a couple on the borders of my park i have the spot in my eye the point is can he live alone there men i say do not change how is it that we cannot say the same of women Letitia remarked the generic woman appears to have an extraordinary faculty for swallowing the individual as to the individual as to a particular person i may be wrong precisely because it is her case i think of my strong friendship inspires the fear unworthy of both no doubt but trace it to the source even pure friendship which is the taint in us knows a kind of jealousy though i would gladly see her established and near me happy and contributing to my happiness with her incomparable social charm her i do not estimate generically be sure if you do me the honour to allude to me sir willoughby said letitia i am my father's housemate what wooer can take that for a refusal you would beg to be a third in the house and sharer of your affectionate burden honestly why not and i may be arguing against my own happiness it may be the end of me the end old friends are captious exacting no not the end yet if my friend is not the same to me it is the end to that form of friendship not to the degree possibly but when one is used to the form and do you in its application of friendship scorn the word use we are creatures of custom i am i confess a poltroon in my affections i dread changes the shadow of the tenth of an inch in the customary elevation of an eyelid to give you an idea of my susceptibility and my dear miss dale i throw myself on your charity with all my weakness bare let me add as i could do to none but you consider then if i lose you the fear is due to my pusillanimity entirely high-souled women may be wives mothers and still reserve that home for their friend they can and will conquer the viler conditions of human life our estates i have always contended our various phases have to be passed through and there is no disgrace in it so long as they do not levy toll on the quintessential the spiritual element you understand me i am no adept in these abstract elucidations you explain yourself clearly said letitia i have never pretended that psychology was my fault said he feeling overshadowed by her cold commendation he was not less acutely sensitive to the fractional divisions of tones than of eyelids being as it were a melody with which everything was out of tune that did not modestly or mutely accord and to bear without a melody in your person is incomparably more searching than the best of touchstones and talismans ever invented your father's health has improved latterly he did not complain of his health when i saw him this morning my cousin amelia is with him and she is an excellent nurse he has a liking for vernon he has a great respect for mr whitford you have oh yes i have it equally for a foundation that is the surest i would have the friends dearest to me begin on that the headlong match is how can we describe it by its finale i am afraid vernon's abilities are really to be respected his shyness is his malady i suppose he reflected that he was not a capitalist he might one would think have addressed himself to me my purse is not locked no sir willoughby letitia said warmly for his donations in charity were famous her eyes gave him the food he enjoyed and basking in them he continued vernon's income would at once have been regulated commensurately with a new position requiring an increase this money 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 but the world will have it so happily i have inherited habits of business and personal economy 
vernon is a man who would do fifty times more with a companion appreciating his abilities and making light of his little deficiencies they are palpable small enough he has always been aware of my wishes then perhaps the fulfilment might have sent me off on another tour of the world homeward though i am when was it that our friendship commenced in my boyhood i know very many years back i am in my thirtieth year said laetitia surprised and pained by a baldness resembling the deeds of ladies they have been known either through absence of mind or mania to display the wig in the deadly intimacy which slaughters poetic admiration sir willoughby punished her by deliberately reckoning that she did not look less genius he observed is unacquainted with wrinkles hardly one of his prettiest speeches but he had been wounded and he never could recover immediately coming on him in a mood of sentiment the wound was sharp he could very well have calculated the lady's age it was a jarring clash of her brazen declaration of it upon his low rich flute notes that shocked him he glanced at the gold cathedral clock on the mantelpiece and proposed a stroll on the lawn before dinner Letitia gathered up her embroidery work as a rule he said authoresses are not needlewomen i shall resign the needle or the pen if it stamps me an exception she replied he attempted a compliment on her truly exceptional character as when the player's finger rests in distraction on the organ it was without measure and disgusted his own hearing nevertheless she had been so good as to diminish his apprehension that the marriage of a lady in her thirtieth year with his cousin vernon would be so much of a loss to him hence while parading the lawn now and then casting an eye on the window of the room where his clara and vernon were in council the schemes he indulged for his prospect of comfort and his feelings of the moment were in such striving harmony as that to which we hear orchestral musicians bringing their instruments under the process called tuning it is not perfect but it promises to be so soon we are not angels which have their dulcimers ever on the choral pitch we are mortals attaining the celestial accord with effort through a stage of pain some degree of pain was necessary to sir willoughby otherwise he would not have seen his generosity confronting him he grew therefore tenderly inclined to Letitia once more, so far as to say within himself. For conversation she would be a valuable wife. And this valuable wife he was presenting to his cousin. Apparently, considering the duration of the conference of his Clara and Vernon, his cousin required strong persuasion to accept the present. End of chapter 14